for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Hemant. And I would now uh, just uh, request uh, Dr. Kathoria, Director and CEO of ICRIA, uh, to uh, say a few words. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm sure all of you uh, are waiting to read uh, what is in that report and the basis for the Ambassador's kind of cautious optimism of the engagement between uh, India and the United States. And the report will be launched in a, in a few minutes from now. I'm not going to stand between you and the Minister for, for very long, but I thought I'll just kind of uh, talk a little bit about what, what ICRIA does. Uh, Honorable Minister of External Affairs, Mr. Salman Khurshid, Excellency Nancy Powell, Ambassador of the United States to India, Ambassador Ronan Sen, Ambassador H.K. Singh. It is indeed with great pride and immense pleasure that I welcome all of you to the launch of ICRIA's report, BIT and Beyond, Advancing India-US Economic Relations, under the aegis of the ICRIA Wadhwani Chair, on India-US policy studies. As you probably uh, have already guessed, uh, the chair is held by uh, Ambassador H.K. Singh, under which this report has been prepared and ably supported by a young and dynamic team. Uh, and TINSI was mentioned, singled out by the, by the ambassador earlier on. As ICRIR celebrates more than 30 years uh, at the forefront of policy making, we fondly recall the vision uh, of our founder, Dr. K.B. Lal, who many of you would probably have heard of, know, who as far back as in 1981, within the environs of where we are sitting today, at the India International Center, ICRIA's first home was at the India International Center, decided that it was time to establish a think tank that would provide analytical and robust basis for economic policy making thereby facilitating India's integration with the global economy and continued engagement with the global economy. That was in 1981. It was, those of you who've studied the Indian economy, it was 10 years later that India actually, uh, the wheels of liberalization began to move in 1991. But ICRIA's contribution in the interim, I think, we would all like to think, and I think there is some truth in that, that you know, there was contribution uh, in the interim made by ICRIA that shaped the discourse uh, of policy making and I don't think that uh, should or can be underestimated. Even as the scope of ICRIA's activities have, have, as you would imagine, significantly enlarged since 1991, uh, since uh, 1981, uh, to include domestic issues that Ambassador Singh has also touched upon that have become extremely important to us, uh, as far as our domestic economy is concerned, and those issues include stabilization of the national economy, urbanization, uh, inclusive growth, and increasingly now climate change. All these today form uh, a core theme of our research agenda. We continue to augment the body of knowledge linked to globalization and strategic aspects of India's economic relations. That was ICRIA's baptism and continues to be important to us, although, as you would imagine, as India's economy liberalizes, uh, a lot more domestic issues become important, and we've embraced them. And we've put out a body of knowledge. Those of you who visit our website, you would see there is a body of knowledge that uh, uh, looks at uh, issues that are important at the domestic level for India. The report on FDI and retail that uh, Ambassador uh, mentioned, impact of internet, uh, impact of mobile telephony, ongoing project uh, on normalization of trade trends, uh, trade relations with Pakistan, uh, to name a few are examples of ICRIA's research at the forefront of the trends linked to globalization. And there are, you know, research, just not to spend too much time, but just to mention, uh, there are various aspects of international finance and regulatory issues that inform India's position in the G20. We are the Secretariat, or not the Secretariat, but we provide help to the Secretariat in the Ministry of External Affairs. There's research on India-Japanese strategic relations, the impact of Indo-Korea, FTA, that also the Ambassador referred to, and 
study on the feasibility of a Taiwan India FTA are currently being done at ICRIA. And ICRIA is also the secretariat for what is known as the PSAG, the Private Sector Advisory Group. The US India Private Sector Advisory Group was set up, for those of you uh, probably know, sitting in the audience, was set up in 2007 as an adjunct to the ministerial level India US Trade Policy Forum of the Government of India and the Government of the United States. The PSEG co chairs uh, in India are Dr. Isha Aluvalia, our chairperson, and on the United States side, uh, a very well known economist, Dr. Fred Bergston, who's currently the director of the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. Uh, the objective of the PSAG is to provide strategic recommendation and policy insights. Uh, and uh, there has been a report on sectoral uh, technology trade agreement that was submitted to the Trade Policy Forum, which Ambassador referred to, uh, which is in a state of dormancy at the moment. The BIT and Beyond report continues, as you would notice, continues the trend uh, of ICRIA working on contemporary issues of relevance in a very challenging economic environment and suggests a roadmap uh, for India's enhancing uh, its engagement uh, in trade and investment with the United States, as Ambassador mentioned, through a BIT in the short term and perhaps uh, a little more optimistically with an FTA in, in the near future. Uh, and uh, I hope we see uh, the, the, the fructification of some of these uh, initiatives. And finally, let me say that uh, we at ICRIA uh, appreciate the careful and industrious efforts of Ambassador Singh and his dynamic team in preparing this concise and very, uh, when you read it, it's a very reader-friendly report. We thank the Vadwani Foundation for generous support to the Honorable Minister, Mr. Sarman Khurshid, and Excellency uh, Ambassador Powell for gracing this important event which has been jointly organized by ICRIA and ASPEN. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Kathoria, uh, for your uh, illuminating words and also for your contribution uh, uh, and increasing contribution of ICRIA and wish you all the best in your further endeavors. Uh, may I now request uh, our dear friend, uh, Ambassador Nancy Powell, to share our thoughts with us. All these tall people. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste, assalamu alaikum, and good evening to all of you. It is a real honor for me to be here tonight alongside External Affairs Minister Krishid, Ambassador Sen and Singh, and Dr. Katuria. Reports such as the one that brings us together tonight as well as its CIS, CSIS counterpart from Washington, provide invaluable recommendations, analysis, and perspectives on the decisions governments make that can help or hurt economic relations. I'd like to congratulate CSIS and ICREA on these very, very thorough analyses. All of us in the room tonight have a chance to help shape the future of the US-India relationship. The year 2013 offers a special window of opportunity. The US has just concluded an election in which President Obama and his second administration team will be looking to fulfill the pledges that were made during the campaign and to complete initiatives that were begun during the first term. When he was here in 2010, President Obama said, US-India ties are a defining partnership of the 21st century. We can all contribute to this important relationship and help to fulfill the commitments both countries have made to invest in our intertwined futures. Toward that end, I want to welcome Ambassador Singh and I Career's recommendations for both countries to exercise flexibility in investment negotiations, for continued efforts to further reform the Indian economy in addition to bilateral agreements, and the call to look beyond the bit to conduct a cost-benefit analysis on international trade agreements outside of the WTO. These are all extraordinarily well-timed. Under the U.S.-India Strategic Dialogue, 
Both countries have regular channels to engage on these and many other key drivers of economic growth. And we need to further strengthen and reinvigorate our efforts through frank discussions of new ideas that lead to us to action plans and ultimately to concrete delivery. Whether it is through partnering and manufacturing to create jobs in both our countries, collaborating more closely on strengthening infrastructure in India, extending regional economic connectivity to third countries, setting an example globally on energy cooperation, or teaming up to advance innovation through increased protections on intellectual property and greater investments in research, there is much that India and the United States can do together. At the close of 2012, former Assistant Secretary Rick Inderforth celebrated the release of the U.S. counterpart to tonight's report. Taken together, these reports provide invaluable analysis and recommendations about the path our two governments can consider to further strengthen this already vibrant relationship. Reports like these are excellent starting points for thoughtful discussions about practical steps both governments and private sectors can take to bring this relationship to the next level. The United States applauds the recent decisions by the government of India to offer greater predictability in India's tax regime and to invite foreign invest investors into new segments of the Indian economy. Opening new avenues for companies from both of our countries to exchange ideas, best practices, and grow businesses together will benefit all of us in the long run. There are many examples of how this is already happening. I was in, in Guwahati last month, where I inaugurated a new American business corner, aimed at assisting India's small and medium-sized companies to connect with, in, with U.S. companies. In Hyderabad, I have seen how U.S. and Indian companies employ thousands of engineers in research and development centers that feed new products and processes that span our globe. In Chennai, workers from rural households, households work for U.S. companies such as Caterpillar that make mining and construction equipment to build global infrastructure. Our state-to-state -state and local partnerships are an example of this effort. I'm proud to say our peoples, our cities, and our states are connecting like never before. For instance, Next Monday, the mayor of San Antonio, Texas, will bring a delegation of 23 companies and state-level government officials to Delhi, then on to Hyderabad and Chennai. Healthcare, information technology, automotive manufacturers, higher education, among other sectors, will be represented in this delegation. In early February, Governor Jack Markell will bring 15 businesses and government officials to meet with their counterparts in Mumbai, Bangalore, and Delhi to strengthen business ties and promote investment opportunities in Delaware. Previous visits to India include Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley's historic trip to India that created $60 million in two-way business in infrastructure, technology, education, and security. Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir, whose three trips to India in an effort to promote engagement with states and cities throughout the country, yielded Kentucky a $7 billion, 25-year private sector energy deal. And Virginia continues to sustain nearly $300 million in annual exports of goods to India. It has developed many sustainable ties. In 2010, Nor Norfolk, Virginia, became the first city on the U.S. East Coast to have a sister city alliance with India through partnership with the city of Kochi in Kerala. Regional engagement also strengthens small and medium-sized enterprises in both countries by sinking sectors and regions. In India, these SMEs contribute nearly 45% of manufacturing output and 40% of national exports. The United States SME sector has more than doubled its exports to India in the past decade. Ambassador Singh, I want to say again how much I applaud the thorough analysis your report provides of U.S.-India trade and investment and the detailed outline of India's present foreign investment policy. I hope that this report, along with its CSIS counterpart and others, will serve to open a productive discussion on our paths forward. 
I urge our governments and private sectors to take the visionary ideas generated in these reports and to turn them quickly into practical, concrete action. It will be on this solid foundation that we can unleash the true potential in our bilateral economic relationship. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for your, uh, uh, for your suggestions and for your, uh, and the comments that you made, which are very encouraging. Uh, now I have the uh, pleasure to request uh, our uh, chief guest, uh, uh, External Affairs Minister, the Honorable External Affairs Minister, Mr. Salman Khurshid, uh, to share his thoughts with us, his vision with us. And, and this is a very important occasion because this is uh, uh, his first uh, uh, his, the first time he'll be doing so and speaking on India-U.S. relations. So, and we look forward with great anticipation to listening to you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening to you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ronan Sen for... Uh, raising the bar, uh, and that puts a, a heavy burden on me. Um, Excellency Ambassador Nancy Powell, Ambassador H.K. Singh, and uh, the driving force of this report, Dr. Rajat Kathuria, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, faces that uh, uh, one, one associates with the, the long story of relations between the U.S. and India and uh, their contribution that uh, many of you have made to this uh, remarkable tale. Um, I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, and of course, conscious of the fact that this comes soon after the uh, inaugural of President Obama for the second term, um, at which, as the ambassador said, uh, many of the visionary steps that, uh, that uh, were uh, was spoken of, promised during the campaign. We'll see, see come to, we will see come to fruition in the next four years. And I'm told the, uh, the second term of the American president can be the best term um, uh, uh, in, in a sense. Unfortunately, um, as that is an institution that we haven't yet figured out in our country. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, every term of ours is a very bad term. Because at the end, at the end, there is still desire for another term. Uh, anyhow, uh, be that as it may, uh, I must uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, this this talk of economic partnership that is of the most highest significance to both of us today comes in the context of uh, our reflection uh, of what has happened in the two decades that I've been away from the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, as I come back here um, after the 1990s, early 1990s, um, obviously we see explicitly a remarkable transformation in the change that has taken place in the India-US relationship during this period. Um, we were still at the fag end in 1990s of, of the concept or the perception of estranged democracies. And we are here now as strategic partners, as very important trade partners, and working together in many fields of human endeavor that are extremely significant. But I want to say something, Ambassador, that perhaps has never been said to you before. Just as our economy was never entirely state-controlled, and it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, model uh, that we call the mixed economy that has state control and free enterprise work hand in hand. Similarly, our relationships with, relationship with the United States of America was never entirely a relationship of negativity. It was a mixed relationship. We worked together. The good, the good and the not so good worked together all the time. And therefore, when the moments of transformation came, all we needed to do was to change the mix of the economy as far as 
our economic model was concerned, concern, and change a little mix of our relationship as far as this wonderful relationship between the US and India is concerned. And uh, what we, we have done essentially is taken the positive elements of our relationship and those positive relationship uh, elements of our relationship have always been of great significance to us as two important democracies of the world. And we've highlighted those and added to them an economic content. So it makes, as it were, a very powerful model because what we've added is economics to what essentially was what could be described as an extra economic relationship that always existed between the US and India. But the important thing, of course, is that uh, no matter what George Bernard Shaw would say, we now speak a lot more uh, American English, uh, particularly amongst <laughs> our young people, uh, than, uh, than the English English. Uh, be that as it may, but uh, I hope that we have over the years also, uh, as I gathered from the manner of your, your uh, greeting of, of the audience, uh, we have also added to your vocabulary many words uh, and many phrases from Indian languages that enrich, uh, as, as indeed has always been the case, with American culture. So this important, this important collaboration, convergence, and uh, cooperation uh, now has a very strong, very strong fundamental basis. And I think described, described uh, exceptionally, exceptionally vividly by the president himself during his visit here in 2010. And I do want to share with you that I had the good fortune to accompany him across the country. And in Mumbai, as he stood watching, watching the, uh, the, uh, the books and, 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 uh, uh, and various things that belong to Mahatma Gandhi uh, on display, uh, uh, for a moment, I felt that uh, he had transported himself to, to another plane. And then he looked at me and said, do you know that if it hadn't